FGC Hollywood. Stay classy. We actually just, I think about six or seven of us, we just watched the uh, UFC 254 and F the FGC Hollywood Discord. Shoutouts to Sergeant Pancakes for streaming it for us. But yeah, it's I understand what you're saying. When it's the smaller community, it's it's nicer. That's why with our Discord, we just hit a number where like, I'm really comfortable with that number. I don't necessarily want it to get much bigger than that. Cause not right now we got about 20 to 30 people that I can keep track of. Like I know their names. I know what they kind of like, what they're about. Once you start start diluting that, it becomes more of a. It's still a community, but it's just a lot of just gamer tags. <laughs> yeah, man. It, yeah, it, it turns into like a mosh, a hosh, mosh pit of all these random ass people, man. Mm -hmm. All right, here we are, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to FGC Hollywood, a fighting game podcast, episode seven. We've done seven of these, and I have a feeling we're gonna. If you haven't gotten mad at us on the last six this one might push you over the edge but my name is max Splicer. i'm joined as always by pringle the one pringle how you doing on this fine saturday evening i'm doing all right man you know got a little burrito i think one of the little microwave burritos pretty mm. good yeah i'm good not one of those like really gross gas station ones you know those really fat long ones they yeah. sell at 7-eleven and you know when you eat that you're just gonna have the worst food poisoning ever <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's bad no i I get a small little one just to just hold me down for now, but I'm good. I'm doing good, man. Sweet. So, dude, my memory is so bad. Zio wasn't messing around when he said I had like a memory of a dog. What were we just talking about? <laughs> I said I wanted to save something for the podcast. Oh, the uh, story about my dog. Okay, so l last week when we recorded episode six of this podcast, I made a mistake of leaving my dog downstairs because I, I normally take him up here into the office when we record because he's mischievous right he gets into stuff if i don't watch him so mm. last week i was like ah, eh, you know the kitchen is for the most part it's clean and there he, he likes the couch down there so i'll just leave him down there and then we'll record and i'll go back so because it was my birthday weekend i forgot that my dad made me a cake and the cake was pushed all the way to the counter and i was just like oh, there's no way he gets into that and we recorded for what like two and a half hours close to three hours so I didn't even think about the cake. But anyway, I go downstairs and I see like the cake tray even further pushed in to the counter. It's like now it's touching the wall of the counter because <laughs> okay. he kept taking bites out of the cake, but he kept pushing the tray further and further away from him. I was like, yeah, God goddamn. Damn. Dude, he if he has any way of getting food while I'm not around and it's not like this dog doesn't get proper meals set at each time every day but he's such a glutton that anytime he can sneak anything he will so he's locked into the in the in the recording dungeon with me right now as he, he normally is that dude so you're telling me he ate some of your cake yeah he did <laughs> so, my boy my boy the man said it's my birthday now bro yeah he just <laughs> so god damn yeah, that's, man that's my dog All right well we have a few things on Adanka before we get to fighting game stuff. I, I talked to my roommate the other day, and this more has to do with like Grand Blue and stuff, but do you mm -hmm. remember the last time you spent full price on a game? So the full $60 bill on, on a game. Damn, I got to think about it because I definitely do not try to do that all ever anymore because nowadays whenever I buy full price games, I get ripped off. So mm -hmm. I don't do that anymore. Um, Oof. Man, I really got to think about that. So I was going through my purchases. First of all, I get games super cheap. I just realized it's like all fighting games that I get are like $7, $6. They're all cheap. Exactly, man. The way. That's the right way. The last time I spent $60 on a game was June of 2017, and I was Tekken 7. Oh, man. Wow, dude. Yeah, that's been out for a while, huh? <laughs> you just made me think about that. <laughs> ah, yeah. I didn't even get that game. A buddy got that for me. And I never. I wasn't even going to buy it anyways. I, didn't, I wasn't planning at all in buying that game whatsoever. But then a buddy got it for me. And then I got pretty interested in Tekken 7 afterwards. Mm -hmm. Ooh, that's a good question, man. I, uh, I yeah, the... Ooh, I, I can't I can't think of it. I, I really cannot think. I think the last time I bought anything kind of full price, but it wasn't a game, was the expansion pack to like final fantasy 14 my nerd ass bought the <laughs> the the uh shadow bringers i bought that one for like i think like at the time like 40 dollars. so i can't say i've spent oh, 60 in a game in a very 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 long time dude like man nah man that's it like i can't even think of anything i'm always trying to find cheap deals because nowadays i don't want to like 
since I'm like more into collecting now, I try not to buy anything at full price because usually some of these games aren't like, I don't know if you know about the Kingdom Hearts series, but the game, the third one, I was waiting for a long time for that one. Man, I still didn't buy that at full price, dude. I was like, I waited 14 years. What's another year? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I waited like uh, like half a year and I saw it on eBay for like $23. And that game sold for, I think even at that time, it was at like 50 or 40 or something like that. Yeah. These these games that they come out, they're full price. Let's be honest, man. You give it like half another year, that thing's going to be half the price most likely. Like, that's not that much waiting. There's plenty of games, plenty. In 2020, there is a sea of games just out there for you to play in the meantime. And if you're willing to pay $60, that means you probably should understand that for those same $60, you can probably buy so much more other games of better value. Yep. Absolutely. And speaking of better value, we got we actually got some really good deals on this week's game sales. It's mostly all on PC, but yeah, we actually got some some good deals, even better than last week, I, I find, especially on the Nintendo platform. So I'm all about trying to save people some money when it comes to fighting games. Yeah, man, seriously, dude. Save your money, man. It, it, it'll, it'll pay dividends in the future. <laughs> mm-hmm. All right, Pringle, we have Hollywood question of the week. And this one has to do with tournaments. So when considering a fighting game major to attend, outside of location, rank these aspects in order of most to least important. The reason why I said outside location, because location is like one of the biggest factors ever. Obviously, if you have a major that's right next outside to you. Outside that daddy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's large pool of titles to enter, smooth bracket running, favorable playing or spectating conditions, meaning the size of the venue or the fact that certain venues get really hot. So how, how they space it out or AC cooling and stuff like that scale of tournament. So number of attendees, variable side attractions. So that means arcade rooms, merchandise options, restaurants, et cetera, things to do outside of the FGC aspect of the tournament. So I would say it's a hard one between the smooth bracket running and the variable side attractions. Mm. I will say that for me, the least, the, the one I care so little about probably is the amount of people, uh, honestly. Like, I think after a certain point, you don't really need that much more people. I mean, it could, it's great when there's a lot of uh, thousands of people, but you really don't need much more. I think with Combo Breaker, what happened is when I went in 2016, man, there was like, it was it was like full, but not super full. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like it, it had people. You could play Persona Four and Blaze Blue in the corner, corner over there. There was only like four setups of those two games, and that was more than enough because there wasn't that much people playing those games. But then come like I think I saw I saw like the later combo burgers. Oh, dude, it was so packed, man. I'm over here like yo. I, I was I was over there. I was like I don't remember that other room. Where did this room come mm-hmm. from? Like they had a whole other side of a venue. I swear I'd never seen it before when I went over there in 2016. And what happens though is that when the scale gets so big, it's like it feels it feels like so claustrophobic, man. Like look at what happened to Evo. And I know Combo Breaker probably will never go that route. Hopefully not. But it happened with Evo, man. It turned into this like this. It's not even about the games, man. It's about the freaking making uh, connections. It's about putting your stuff out there, your games, all this crap. It didn't even. It's like a convention, man. It's like it's not about the the the, the people playing the games, and I hated that. Mm-hmm. But I'll go back to saying that the smooth bracket running is very important to me. I've been in a tournament, man, and this was like a Smash tournament. Dude, I've waited so long, man. <laughs> I waited. Like, I did. I got to, I, I don't remember what I got, like, losers, quarters, or whatever in my pool or whatever, right? I don't. I didn't think I got out the pool or whatever. Mm-hmm. I drowned. <laughs> All right. And, you know, I can't swim anyways. Between each match, I had to wait, like, two to three hours, man. I was Jeez. like, bro, this, it, and, it, and because, and now I'll go right next to the, because there was nothing to play on the side, the variable side attractions, it made it 10 times worse, bro. I was just sitting there. I'm like, I don't want to play Smash no more, bro. I'm bored. I want to go home. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I've had this in a lot of cases with bad bracket running. I'm glad our locals, Sm- Salem Smash Fist, shouts out to those dudes right quick. Mm-hmm. They run every, we run things so well and smooth. And we usually keep the fighting game stuff last because we know at the end of the day, our man was honking his horn over here. I'm sorry. Man. It's so <laughs> no, you're good. But yeah, man. So. At least when it's in our locals, it makes sense. You could just go home, you know what I'm saying? But in a major, that smash semi, it was like a regional, but it was kind of like a major I went to. 
I waited so long between each match that it made me just feel like I just got hungry. I got tired, man. I, I just wanted to go home. And then it ruins. I, I really think it ruins the player's mindset. Like It ruined my mind. I was like, man, screw this place, man. I hope it burns down right now, man. I want to go home because they messing with my time. This isn't supposed to be like a whole day thing. It doesn't need to be because, but because it was ran so bad, it became so long between each match, man. I, like we went there in the morning. We came out late at night and I was like, what the hell is this crap? There's not even that much people. There's there's tournaments that run so much better because they have good logistics and all that stuff and good TOs. But a bad ran tournament can t- waiting three hours for your match is gonna not want you to play no more, man. I don't know what it is, but when I play a tournament match, I'm like, oh, not now, not anymore. But before, when I first started, especially when you first start, because this is when I first started like competing, it ruined everything for me. And it happened. It happened another time in another smash, but it was a local thing. This is why I don't like smash tournaments, man. That's something about it. But I went to a local, bro. They didn't even have chairs for your brother. So you know what I did? I had to play on my goddamn knee, man. Oh, I can't do that. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, man. It was so bad. I won though, but I played on my knee. It sucked ass, man. Then on the other end, it's like there's nothing for me to do on the side of, of just waiting. Like you're just waiting and you can't do nothing. Mm. And then I will also say that, yeah, the heat is pretty important. Like, if you go to like for people that travel, especially for the majors, I'd say maybe that's the third one to me because hey man, if you just bring your hoodie, you'll be all right. One thing I messed up on, man, is when I went to Combo Breaker uh 2016, I didn't bring no hoodie, man. It was so freaking cold up in that goddamn yeah, Chicago. It's like cold. ice box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then this is what I got pissed off about. I was like, all right, let me just buy a hoodie. I go to those guys and they're like, the hoodie's forty dollars. I'm like, man, I ain't paying no forty dollars <laughs> for a goddamn hoodie. You tripping, man? That's way too much for a hoodie. Should've like, been the like you know, last time I played for, a, or I paid full price for a game. <laughs> yeah, man, yeah, for real, dude. You think you damn well think I'm not gonna pay full forty dollars for a normal hoodie? It was just like black. It was nothing special about it. It won't even zip up too. So I had to roll with it. Mm-hmm. So if it gets too hot, I gotta take it out. And I'm like, I already got the sweat stains in my pits, man. So that freaking <laughs> sucked, dude. But. I, I would definitely say from probably the order would probably be for me smooth bracket running, variable side attractions, the spectating conditions because they sometimes I'd also say that sometimes the size is very important because there's just not enough. I just let me just say the scale of the tournament is fourth, but I will also say I had another experience. <laughs> just remind me, I'm not gonna lie, man. Now that I'm reading like saying this out loud, I've had some pretty poor tournament experiences outside of my locals out here in Oregon. They've not been very good at all. Even my combo breaker experience wasn't that good. I didn't even hear my name and I lost my wallet in combo breaker. I lost my phone. I lost my wallet. I didn't hear my name. So when I was in Skullgirls, I was in the loser's bracket and I didn't even hear my name the first time around so I could play normally. So that sucked. But I will say that. So what happened is there was a regional that we have in Oregon. Oh man, dude, I'm, I don't care, man. I don't even care if I'm calling my right now, but dude, they be having no monitors for people. So you have a lack of monitors. Like It's like, how are we going to all warm up when all 20 of us are trying to play Guilty Gear, but there's only two monitors? Come on, man. Yeah. That ain't going to work. Ah, oh, dude. My tournament experience has been bad. <laughs> sound, yeah, I was going to say, it sounds rough. I'm just amazed I still played after all those poor-ass <laughs> tournament experiences I've had. Dude, I just want to like compete, but then like I'm, I'm sitting there. I'm like, dude, it's been like two hours. When is my match, man? And then it comes, and I'm like, I don't want to play this crap no more, man. Go go home. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I didn't go to Combo Breaker 2016. I went to 2017, 2018, and 2019. And I would say 2019 was probably the best one. They ran it super smooth. So one thing I, I liked about the TOs is that they, first of all, they were really professional with how they set up that certain station and they make sure to get all the names they would do everything that they can to push them to the last match but if that guy didn't show up they didn't pay no favorites so or rather they didn't play no favorites so it's nice to see that they're treating everybody the same so Mm -hmm. smooth bracket running is very very important because of the fact that everybody has different pools right i like when we went to combo record 2019 I had noon pools, but my friends had 6 p.m. pools. So it's nice to get the matches that I'm going through to get those out of the way. And then me and my friends can do something else or get something to eat until their pools start. And then I can, you know, be there for them. So smooth bracket running is huge because if, if you're waiting hours in between matches, you can't be doing that, man. Yeah, man. Oh, I, I'm sorry, but I didn't even see the large pool of titles there. I got so engrossed with what I was saying. <laughs> right, but right. Yeah, dude. Uh 
I don't think you need many games because in the end, like they're just gonna put the popular ones and then whatever comes afterwards, mm-hmm. fine with me. If I can find a game I'm I'm gonna play, I'll play it. But like usually I'm not gonna find like Skullgirls in the pool, so whatever, it don't matter. Yeah, I usually limit my tournament entries to two. So I'll play I'll play two games. I find that easy to to manage with, with your time and the fact that you're not running around all over the place. So I'm okay with not having that many titles. So I get, okay, so let me rank these. So I, I was thinking about this earlier. So I would say, I agree with you, smooth bracket running is huge because you kind of want to get in and get out. Secondly, I yeah, would man. say favorable playing expecting conditions. So let's be honest. When I go to a tournament, I don't expect to win because I didn't put in the work to win, right? I just kind of want to play, have fun, you know, maybe ruin somebody's day, right? And then just spectate, you know, have a good time watching and cheering on and, and, you know, watching the hype moments. So having good seating, having the AC working, having things set for you as a spectator, that's huge in my opinion. Yeah, man. Thirdly, I would say variable side attractions, man. It's so nice in between pools to go, if they have like an old school arcade to go play old school games, what kind of merchandise options they have. I know a lot of people like that. They got t-shirts, they got art, they got those keychains and all that stuff. It's cool to look through all that stuff. And obviously restaurants, you know, Combo Breaker is held in St. Charles and the, you know, that's close to Chicago. Dude, so. there's like, there's like nothing around there, right? There is a pizza place that serves deep dish if you like deep dish. And we go oh, there okay. every year, so it's it's not bad. There, there are a few places around Combo Breaker, at least the Pheasant Run Resort. And obviously Pheasant Run also has their own little thing because it's a resort. And then the last two, again, I don't really care about the scale of the tournament. So I would probably put the large pool of titles to enter as number four and then scale tournament as last. Because whether it's 800 people or 3,000 people, it doesn't really make a difference to me. I'm just there to have a good time. Yeah, that's one of the things about Combo Breaker, too. It doesn't really have anything around that area. It's like a, what is it, like a rich area? St. Charles? I think it's like this rich, nice area in Chicago. Well, actually, that side of St. Charles is not as close to St. Louis. But I don't know if it's rich or not. But, I mean, that that area that they were renting that venue for, it was a, it was a golf resort. So could be kind of a fancy area i don't know they have a question man did they change the venue like the place like it was still in st charles but did they change the venue yeah I, really, I don't know since you yeah they, they did they did and i don't exactly remember to where but i i do think it's still relatively close to where the old venue was but obviously COVID hit and then we couldn't have gone but yeah next year if there is a combo breaker i would like to check out that new venue it's just be- mostly because it's i'm so close being here to to drive to, to st charles so that's why i make it a point of emphasis to try to take that weekend off and go play some fighting games did they uh did they change the venue by through the years you were there no uh, every oh, year that I've yeah. gone was Pheasant Run Resort. Okay, okay, okay. Mm-hmm. I swear, man, there's like this. I I swear when I saw them playing like uh, a lot of the older like older retro fighting games, I was like, where is this? Did I not find this one? <laughs> 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 I tried looking for it, but I just couldn't find it, man. That that's Combo Breaker. I would say is probably the best major to attend to. I think it has all of these things, outside of maybe the lack of like things around the area, but like. Combo Breaker does it so well in a way where there's plenty of to do in the uh, in the venue. Yeah. So you have like all of these just games all over the place. You got all kinds of fighting games, and I like I like that about them, dude. Like even the line to get inside the venue, there was like some uh, there were some arcades, and then I saw some brothers playing Melty Blood on the table, yeah, of man. course, <laughs> on laptops. So, so I was like, yeah, man, that's what I like about. Yo, why don't they got like? Oh wait, wait, they do. I was about to say, why don't they got a tournament for Melty? But yeah, I think Combo Breaker, I would say, is a really good major for that reason. It, it really is the spirit of fighting games, man. Definitely the spirit, man. Yeah, I highly recommend. And the uh, the side attractions are cool with it, like not so much the restaurants and things to do outside of the venue, mm-hmm. but it was cool. Like my friends and I, after we all got bodied, we went to go play at the old school arcade that they had set up there. So we play Tekken oh, 5 yeah. and some other titles. And then they had like a cosplay competition, which was cool. So oh, yeah, yeah we, we, had a, we had a good time. It was cool. That's one of the, like, I will say, cause like that was one of the good things uh, about combo breakers that they had just so many things around for you to play. And it's just overall, it's more like for a fighting game player too. Cause like, mm-hmm. if you mention like, if you want those, those other things around, then you go to like Evo cause it has gambling. You gamble. It's Vegas, man. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You go and gamble. You do, you, you live it up. That's the reason why you would more so go to Evo 
Because if you lose in pools, right, like you ain't going to make it. You drown, right? Whatever. You couldn't swim. You didn't get your floaters. <laughs> yeah. So you go into like, you go into even and you're like, I'm just going to gamble my money. I already lost here. How could bad could it be? You know, and you go and gamble, you lose all your money. And at least you, you know, you could do something else like that. But that's, that's, I feel like Eagles become more of like the major, like for the, like the general casual audience. And Comic it really is for the people that really in the fighting games. Like you could play that stuff like all day. Yeah, I, I highly recommend that tournament. It's a, it's a really good tournament, and we'll see how they come back next year. If we if we can make it that I could go, I, I'd like go with like my girlfriend, and then we gotta like we gotta make like the uh, the Hollywood podcast a live edition. Oh, right? that'd be nice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, that would be nice. Yeah, yeah. We meet up, set it up, and we do one of those. Yeah, that that'd be tight. We should definitely have, and obviously we should have an announcement for the Hollywood Discord to you know everybody should go to Come Break or so. Yeah, definitely, dude. Well, hopefully there is a cum breaker next year and we can actually go to one because, you know, who knows what's going on with this pandemic. <laughs> but before we move on to the news this week, we have some podcast correction, Prinkles. I'm not, you know, I'm okay. not one of these people who always pretends to always be right <laughs> about things. So nah, I made some mistakes. We're definitely last week. not always right. <laughs> <laughs> I made some mistakes last week uh, compiling the show notes. So here are my corrections that I found. So. First thing first is we were talking last week about who is working on the Guilty Gear plus R netcode or or the rollback. We didn't know. All we knew is it wasn't Code Mystics. It turns out mm-hmm. that it was originally a fan made project, and Arxis decided to just give those guys a source code. So those are the so guys. So it was Mike Z. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> because he was one of those big passionate dudes about that. But yeah, yeah that's actually pretty cool, man. So yeah, so they're working on it. Obviously, the beta is going to start on the 29th. And I don't know how long it's going to be, but when the, that news comes out, we'll talk about it. As far as the new character reveal trailer in Guilty Gear Strive, I said that there will be that trailer will be on New Year's Day 2021, but that hasn't been confirmed. Now, I'm assuming that obviously the last character will be within that announcement, but I don't know that. So the only thing that we know is that there is a Guilty Gear Strive related announcement on New Year's Day 2021, but as far as a character being revealed there, it has not been confirmed as of yet. It's probably going to be a character. Let's be honest. Yeah. That's all they've been showing us. Mm-hmm. Just character trailers, so what else is it going to be? Right. We'll find out when that happens. But yeah, I'm pretty sure you're right. It's probably going to be a character. Yeah, man. And the last correction of this week is Phantom Breaker Omnia and its netcode. We were talking about, hey, are they talking about doing rollback? Or are they going to do delay? What are they doing? So... I said when I read those notes, there was no confirmation on Netcode, which there wasn't. However, they made a tweet shortly after, which I did not see. So Rocket Panda Games confirmed that no, there's no GGPO or rollback of any kind. And this is the tweet. So this is a tweet responding to somebody else asking on Twitter, hey, what, what about the Netcode? So, quote, when we first started this project, the very first question to our devs was, hey, GGPO rollback Netcode? After about a month of exploring the feasibility for Phantom Breaker Omnia, it just wasn't meant to be. But if this thing takes off, you can bet we'll put it in the next one. End quote. Yeah, that's not going to happen. No. (laughs) What makes you think it's going to take? Well, it depends, actually. What is their takeoff? Maybe selling 10 copies is their takeoff. (laughs) So, like, but come on, man. Let's be honest. If you don't have... From what I've seen with that game, mm, that's a hard buy, man. That's going to be a hard buy. It better be dirt cheap. So we initially didn't see much gameplay from the announcement trailer, but there are two gameplay trailers out there in the wild. And uh, man, I was not impressed. I'm sorry. Like, I did not yeah, like what I saw. Yeah, I, saw it too. I don't want to judge it just yet, but uh, it was rough. It was rough. Yeah, it, did, it didn't seem like it just seemed like I'll be real, man. It looked like Kasoga, man. <laughs> <laughs> I was like it's looking like a Kasoga game. They have to do something to make themselves look better because they just look like another game in the sea of anime games. No, it didn't leave a very good lasting impression, but who knows? It might come out and prove us wrong. Yeah. I, eh, hey, if it's two dollars, that's not that bad of a purchase. Yeah. If you're gonna pull out and it'd be like 40, well, good luck. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna probably assume it's gonna come out around 29 or maybe even 39, depending on how they package yeah. any additional content so who knows i would say that if you can't go rollback at least just make your delay net base net cone as good as you can you know what i'm saying like it doesn't have to be bad but usually what happens is that it turns into doo-doo butter yeah so hopefully they know i mean by the fact that they brought up the possibility of rollback hopefully they are 
focusing on making the delay that they do have the best mm -hmm. that they can make it. So we'll see once we get it. So that's all for the corrections this week. Now we can finally move on to fighting game news. And it's a bit of a slow week this week as far as news, but we we made some things, or rather we pulled some strings to I think make this show a little more enticing. But let's start with the first item of the news. So Grand Blue Fantasy Versus Season 2 Pass is here. Well, I guess it's been here for a while, but now we got some additions to it. So following the Arc System Works live stream of Arc Revo Japan, which was held on October 17th, 2020, the highly anticipated Grand Blue Fantasy vs. character trailer for Cagliostro was shown at the end of said tournament. Cagliostro joins the new total playable roster of 18 characters and is now available for play either through the game Season Pass 2, priced at $34.99. damn! Jesus Christ! Go ahead. <laughs> or as an individual DLC priced at $6.99. At the end of the Cagliosa trailer, another character by the name of UL was teased and then later confirmed to release sometime in the late in late December 2020. UL will be the third and last season pass two character added to the game in 2020 with three more planned for release in 2021. So we were talking about some prices, huh? $34.99. Damn! Yo, that's like more, that's like 55% of the price of the whole game. And <laughs> right. Jeez. Oh, man, that's so much. That's How do people, how are, and the game only got 18 characters? And wait, wait, okay, so like here, here's a little thing that I, I learned recently with uh, Grand Blue. When did this game come out? February, right? Around February? Something like that. This game is... Yeah, this game has had so much passes that it managed to get into season two in the same year of October, eight months later. Yo, Tekken 7 just hit, what, season four? By the end of season four, right? Mm -hmm. And that game's been around for like three years, man. Right. What, like, why is there, like, I've, I've heard a lot of people complain about, like, how they keep buffing and nerfing and patching the game so much. I'm trying to find an identity. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ain't that a body, huh? <laughs> You know what happens when you keep buffing and nerfing characters and you keep messing around with it? Nobody can really stick to one thing. It makes it so hard. Like, I cannot stay with that game if I was playing it competitively. If they nerf my character, I'm like, oh, man, they nerf it so bad like, I have to drop it or just use a bad character and hope they buff it. But, dude, season two and the character, the roster is only 18 characters. Damn, man. And, and what is it? They said the season two is about to end, right? So UL, which will come out in December, she'll be the she'll be three of six for season two. Uh -huh. And then three more, uh, or rather, the completion of season two will be sometime in 2021. Jeez, man, that's so much like, that's so expensive, bro. $35? Yeah. Seven bucks a character? Man, these guys got deep ass pockets. <laughs> Come on, man. Have you ever you heard about those people spending thousands of dollars on the Grand Blue mobile game, man? Mm -hmm. They got so much money that they can make a fighting game. And they don't make another game, too, which is, I think it's called Grand Blue Relink. You know you got some deep-ass pockets when you're, like, you're just sitting in the table and you're like, why don't we make a fighting game? I'm like, wait a minute, why? I'm like, <laughs> eh, let's go for it, man. It's like, dude, that's crazy, man. I $7 per character, 35 that's absurd, bro. That is kind of absurd. Just to put it in perspective, it's almost as if you're making a new game because mm -hmm. when Under Night and Birth went from EL to ST, the expansion, I I believe it was $39, which, but technically that's a different game because the balance is completely different. They added a few more features and they also couple the characters. So there is no season pass. So what you buy in that game, that's what it stays with. Same thing for yeah. CLR with Undernight. It was $39, I believe. But those are different games, right? They're technically expansions of the same game, but they're standalone titles. This is $34, $35, and it's a season pass, which to me is insane because all you're, all you're bringing with that season pass is some cosmetic options here and there, and then six characters. Did they even mention stages, man? I don't know about stages so much, but normally stages come with the characters, I think. Yeah, don't quote that's me on that. True. They yeah. might. No, nah, they usually do, but yeah. Either way, that don't really mean much. No, but it is, in my opinion, I think it's overpriced. I don't think $35 is right to do by players. 
But you know what I realized is that it doesn't seem like Grand Blue Fantasy players really care. They, they'll pay. They're okay with a seven dollars pop for a character. So I yeah. I just, when I read that price too, man, I, my reaction was the same as yours. I was just like, wait, what? It's the same people that pay for the mobile game. Thousand dollars? That's not so bad. It's only like a month's rent. <laughs> yeah. I can go. <laughs> I was like, dude. Jeez, that's nuts, man. It's, I believe it was organization from the Discord mm-hmm. in Hollywood. I was talking about like how games before they better in a way because well, season passes are better because in a way you're not having to purchase the game again. Mm-hmm. And I think I would say that that did suck. Like purchasing the same game over and over. Oh, Super Street Fighter, oh, Ultra Street Fighter, and it's like full almost sometimes like fully priced. Yeah, I would say that's a problem. But to that, I would also say is that. The thing with season passes is, for one, I'm not going to Bush Gardens. Where's my? I, every time I hear the word season pass, I just think of Six Flags or some. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm going somewhere nice, man. I ain't going nowhere nice. Problem though, I think is a real big problem with season passes is that sometimes the season passes, it's almost like I don't know how to explain this. It's almost like you're kind of buying into something you don't know. So what happens is that, like, especially with how they're doing the characters, like for instance, when you bought the whole new game. You knew exactly what you were getting, all the plus characters. Like if you buy Street Fighter V, the normal one, you know there's not many characters. But you buy Championship Edition, it comes with like all of the characters, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the things that what a lot of season passes are doing is that you don't know what character comes next, right? So there'll be like five characters slated for the next season. This is how much it's going to cost. You can buy it now or you can buy it individually later. And I think it's like... What is it cheaper if you just buy it all in the season pass, right? I think it is, right? Seven dollars cheaper, yes. Yeah, yeah. So that's how they kind of get you. It's cheaper if you just buy the full season pass. The problem with that though is that you don't know what you're really getting. You may get three characters that are straight garbage. So why would you pay for a full season pass that costs thirty-five dollars to get like one good character and four other characters that you don't want nothing to do with? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. They may make clones or something like that. Like what? What is it? Drive BBFZ did that crap, man. Where they did like. There's so many Gokus, man. Way too many Gokus. I mean, I don't want all those goddamn Gokus, man. It's just one Goku. (laughs) But they did that. And it's like, it's kind of grimy, personally. It makes it so that they could just kind of keep doing that. And they're fine with doing that. It's like, oh, I'm just going to price it at 35 and uh, each character is like seven bucks. I don't, I don't, I don't, I've stopped buying season passes, especially at full price, because this is another thing with a lot of those games. They're going to release them. Like bare bones in the beginning. Like what well, Grand Blue already had in the beginning, it already had a season pass set up. Like I, I hate that a lot of games are already doing that. That's one of my big pet peeves now, especially with fighting game models, because it doesn't work. It's not like I don't think it works very well. It's it's not a good model because it how does it get the casual audience? You know what I'm saying? Like, does do people just want to buy? Like, and I had a casual friend, a buddy named Chase Face. He does like YouTube stuff. I had a casual friend, he tweeted out one time, and it's so true. He was like, I can't stand buying games, not fighting games nowadays. It's like they're just going to keep putting out new characters. And then later, they're just going to drop the the better version of it. And then it's just, why did I spend money at the time when I could have just saved money and get a full version later? And that's what they're doing still pretty much, even though, like, it's so weird, man. Like, you think they're not repackaging the game, but they still kind of are, man. There's going to be, like, probably, like, a Grand Blue Fantasy Versus, and it's just going to be, like, what, like 30 bucks? And then later on, once all the characters, the, the roster's like 30 characters, it's going to be like $30, and then you get all the seasons. And it's basically like a, a repackaging of the same game at that point, man. You don't know. Okay, so there's six total characters for Season Pass 2. Three of them have been revealed. Okay, or rather, I guess now it's four. I don't know, something like that. You don't know. Let's say you have three or four or three or two of them that you don't know what they're going to be. And you're not interested in the ones that are have been released so far. So you just spend $35 on characters you have no interest in playing whatsoever. And it's a gamble with the other ones that have yet to be revealed. So that's not good because, again, you don't know what you're buying. You don't know what you're getting. The other part is that, in my opinion, unless they're tying some sort of specific balance change, that's why I brought up Unist, is because Unist plays different than Uniclair. That's why you have to make that purchase if you want to play the updated game. Not just get a new character, but it's a different game. With this, in my opinion, 
unless you're a professional player or a player that really values getting better, what would be the incentive of getting this season pass unless you're looking to lab these characters that you weren't going to play in the first place? I don't see a reason to, to do that because if you see a character that's really appealing to you, why not just spend the individual price at seven and then be like, well, whatever. I'm, I don't really care about the other characters. So I'm just not even going to bother with the season pass. They're doing this. They're not doing this to the general audience. They're doing it to you, the video game player, the, the fighting game community member. They're doing it to you. They, they, this is what I They spin in your mouth and you <laughs> out here drinking it. Because that's what it Gross. feels like. Yeah, man. Because why, why would you do that? Why would you put a season pass and price it at 35 when you know that the people that are really playing those games are the ones that are like involved into it, deeply involved into it, right? Mm. It's the only reason why they would like spend that kind of money. It's not going to be a general consensus type of thing. Like the, the casual players aren't going to go out of their way to purchase all of these season passes and DLCs and stuff. It don't make much sense. They're going to play the game out for a bit, a couple of hours, and they're just probably going to drop it. Personally, I think the model of what fighting games have right now, like they just started doing season passes, is horrible model, man. I don't, I don't even, I think Killer Instinct has a better model. I don't, do you, do you know how about their model with the characters and all that stuff? Yeah, where they rotate the cast. Yeah, yeah. And they like, you can buy the character. That's another way to work around the model, but like season passes and DLCs. Honestly, man, that's what kind of turned me off recently with a lot of these fighting games. I'm like, yo, man, how much money I got to spend to keep up with this crap? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, listen, you and I don't need any more reasons why, you know, not to play Grand Blue Fantasy, but <laughs> yeah, they just seriously. added another one. Add it on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just add it on, man. <laughs> this definitely added on. I'm like, I'm, I'm too poor to play Grand Blue, man. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to just play Melty over here in the corner while all mm. my characters are unlocked. Yeah. So, hey, but, you know, if you obviously if you like Grand Blue and you're willing to spend that money, it's all good. I just uh, yeah, we, we thought that was a little pricey. Yeah, by all means, some people could see it as supporting the devs to keep making more games. By all means, support that if you want to. But it's I mean, I got to speak for my wallet, man. That's not like that's that's not right, man. To me personally, like because they're doing it to the fan base, man. It, it's the fans. Those those games like Grand Blue, like all that crap, that stuff gets advertised via tournaments via TOs, via community services. Arc System will only do some tournaments every now and then. And sure, they'll talk about the game and advertise it here and there, but it's not as much, it's not bigger than the community doing it for them. Mm -mm. The, them playing the game, them telling other people, that's really what spreads the word of mouth with the game. But, you know, hey, by all means, that's how they're going to do their fan base. Go for it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, you and I will be on a sideline and if they want to hop on the train, they can go ahead. All right, next item of news is another one that I think is going to get us a little heated. So, oh, man, man we, we're not getting off on the right foot with this game, are we? <laughs> <laughs> Everything is saying no. Yeah. All right, so crossplay and Guilty Gear Strive, yes, but actually no. So Arc System Works, the developer and publisher of the upcoming Guilty Gear Strive, released an FAQ on October 22nd, 2020, which went over some details, including crossplay availability, among other details. Responding to the question, is crossplay between platforms possible? Arc System Works answered with this, quote, we are planning to implement crossplay between PS4 and PS5 versions. There will not be support for crossplay with the arcade or Steam versions. End quote. Mm. I guess we'll start with that first before I end up reading the rest of this stuff. So crossplay. I mean, is this really considered crossplay? That's like saying, well, Xbox 360 can play with Xbox One. Yay. It's like, <laughs> come on, yeah, man. That's not I don't. Play. They did that with blaze blue uh central fiction where it had cross play between ps4 and ps3 i hear that decision isn't up to arc system and i heard that it's up to like sony because mm. like so skull girls had a situation where uh mike z wanted to put cross play amongst everything but he couldn't because of the fact that like i think sony or some bigger developer was telling him they can't do it the publisher mm -hmm. so i think there's something that going above their head but it is funny that when I saw the tweet of them talking about crossplay, everybody in the in the responses was like, yo, man, no PC. That ain't worth it, man. <laughs> That's a hard pass to me. I was like, damn. And I was just over there looking at some other stuff about it that I didn't like. But yeah, that's not helping them at all. It divides the it divides the community again. And once again, 
when you play Rev 2, nobody's playing it on PS4 anymore, which was weird because that's where it was more popular. But they only go into lobbies and there's only like, like 10, 15 people playing at the time. And then you go on PC and it's like the same amount, except the connections are better because people usually use wired. Mm -hmm. So I that's not going to help them at all, man. This I mean, this is uh, I think you said it last uh, podcast. The last show it was uh this is the they're they're basically leading us into the new wave of fighting games right they're the ps5 fighting game is you have to be on top of your game and right now that's not on top of your game no it definitely isn't it's not i don't think it's a smart decision but you know sony has known to do this type of stuff so crossplay mm -hmm. is normally a thing that the console manufacturer that's behind it's kind of like an underdog move that usually is it keeps coming back to that factor so mm -hmm. sony is winning right now ps4 is winning the console wars between xbox one and microsoft so they don't have to do a cross play if they don't want to it's mm -hmm. nice because it gives people like us a larger pool of players to play against instead of just always playing against pc players it's not a yeah. huge factor personally for me but i don't know it's just kind of a slap in the face like yeah, there is cross play but it's only in the sony family yeah. All right. So other details clarified by this FAQ included the ability to play the PS4 version of the game on PS5 using backwards compatibility up to a maximum resolution of 1080p, as well as upgrading the PS5 version of the game if you own a retail version of the PlayStation 4 version of the game. However, only for disc version of the PlayStation 5 console. So <laughs> if you have a the non-disc version of the ps5 you won't be able to upgrade your ps4 version obviously because there's no disc in it so yeah kind of hard but i mean at least you got that so you can go from ps4 to disc version of ps5 for free lastly it has been confirmed that the ultimate edition of the game will not be sold on steam so now it's finally we know that so the ultimate edition is what we talked about last week it comes with all the bells and whistles season pass colors and of course that tag mode that everybody's been talking about and that's only on ps5 so just as a reminder guilty gear strive is set to launch on april 9th 2020 with those who pre-order the game gaining access on april 6 2020 however Early access players will only be able to play 13 out of 15 characters available, the prologue to the story mode with no access to playing online. And then I put a little reminder for you. Oh, thanks. Lobby <laughs> is the same and beef with character trailers. <laughs> oh, 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 man, I got something to say. I was thinking about it all night last <laughs> night. I was like, I was just awake, man. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so of course the Ultimate Edition won't be sold on Steam. That wouldn't make sense, right? It's like, there's some other stuff attached to it, right? Well, so the only thing that comes with the Ultimate Edition that they couldn't put on Steam is the Steelbook cover, right? What? Obviously in the box. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because everything that comes in it is digital, and it, com it comes bundled with the Season Pass. So they, they're they not putting the tag mode and on Steam, and... Outside from that, Man. why I, I don't understand the reason for not having the ultimate edition, but whatever. Like I'm not, I'm not I don't have a huge gripe with it. It's just a weird decision to me. The one part I didn't like about this is like, okay, so you're telling me people are gonna buy the game early, they're gonna pre-order it, they get three days early access, and you're giving them a very limited amount of just features to play around with. Like, so realistically, you're not gonna get super godlike in three in three days for having early access to a game. Maybe if it was like a month, that would be a significant thing, right? But three days, that's, you're not gonna do a lot of damage to the community. So you're only giving them 13 out of 15 characters, which is weird because Angie has already been confirmed, so why? And they can only play a prologue to the story. I don't know how that has any effect. What, spoilers? Just have people not stream it. And then they can't play online, which whatever. I, <sighs> I keep asking why, like why though, like uh, how come, <laughs> and there's no answers. I I don't know. It's just it's weird. But uh, okay, if you wanna Dude, go yeah. ahead, break this down however however you want. Okay, so I will say that I hate that they did that weird thing with Steam where they didn't give us the the things on Steam or the things on the exclusive because it's showing more exclusivity. And it seems like if that's the case, that means that they're just trying to sell the, the game more on the PS5 as opposed to the PS4. The fact that the PS4 doesn't have certain things is weird already to begin well, with. Well, they want to the sell PS5s, cool. right? They want to sell units. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they got to put more stuff on the PS5 because let's be honest, man, The usually the release, the, the con a console release don't got much games to begin with. Mm -mm. Everybody be out here stabbing somebody for a <laughs> PS5 and then they out here like, I only got two games. Right. 
and I don't really care about them. And one of, <laughs> one of them is Knack. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Knack yeah. 2, baby. Knack yeah. 3, best game ever. Let's go. Right. But yeah, so that is definitely a problem. And that three days thing, oh, dude, that's so weird, man. So the two characters are that aren't there are Giovanna, right? And uh, Angie, right? I think those are the... So no, so Giovanna will be playable. But I'm oh, okay. assuming Angie won't. And then the other one that we don't know who it is yet. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, there's another one. Okay, so... I don't understand that though. There's that doesn't incentivize anybody to purchase the game early. Three days early, what am I gonna get? Training room? Because okay, so another thing is this. I'm gonna be real with you, man. I think the marketing for this game is ass, man. Like I think it's not very good at all, and they haven't done anything to give themselves any favors. All they've shown is the game's trailer, and then everything else has just been character trailers, man. How do how does the general population consume that stuff? That stuff only works for like fighting game players, man. <laughs> like. What's going to happen is you're going to get the, the early game access. You're going to have the ability to play it. But then once the knife comes in, you're probably going to have to download more stuff or something right. like that to, to get the full access of this. The story mode should be available for people if they if you're going to give it to them early access. That's such a weird. It's just a story mode. It's Guilty Gear story mode, yeah. man. That thing is like three hours probably. Let's be real. But why not have <laughs> access to all the characters? Because by April 6, 2020, you'll know all the characters that are in the game. Yeah. That's I that they just keep stacking on weird ass decisions, man. So weird. And it makes it harder for me to digest it. And if it's harder for me to eat it, imagine a person that never tried it before. <laughs> Like, they're going to have trouble with all this stuff. It's like, what is all of this? I don't understand all this stuff, man. Like, it, it's really weird. And now, now I'll go for, like, the stuff you mentioned that you reminded me of. Mm -hmm. Yo, I hate that the fact that the lobby is the same, man. I cannot believe they're using that lobby system. It looks like butt cheeks, man. <laughs> you know, Mike Let's Z honest, predicted man. this when I had Yo, him on the show. <laughs> And I was talking to him. He said it, though. Yeah. But I believed it when he said it. He said it once they decide a certain thing. I think this is what he kind of said. It wasn't verbatim, but once they decide a certain thing, they're not really going to change it. Yep. It's very highly unlikely they're going to change it. And I knew it. I, I, I was thinking the same thing because from what I've seen, like, for instance, uh, I want to say, like, Street Fighter Five. They didn't change much of Street Fighter Five when they showed the beta. The graphics looked better, but when on release, it was kind of similar in the same instance. Mm -hmm. It wasn't this significant change that this is this isn't the same game. And it's same thing with like uh, Grand Blue. All they did with Grand Blue, I think, is made it faster, but it's still the same core of its game. Once they decided, man. I don't think it's going to change. And it's true, man. So going back to the lobby, you see the lobby in uh, Rev, and we talked about it before, like in Persona lobbies. Like, actually, the lobby in Strive reminds me of the lobbies in Blaze Blue Central Fiction. It's just a room. Or actually, I'm, am I thinking about BB Tag? BB well, Tag, BB is the tag has, like, yeah, like it looks like a ballroom almost. Yeah, yeah. It's like a bunch of arcades, right? Well, they're not arcades. They're almost like you're about to play Yu-Gi-Oh or some shit. I don't know. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. So I will say, so let me just go back to the lobbies, right? Mm -hmm. So the lobbies in Rev 2, they were like arcades. You go up, you walk up, and you play somebody. Two buttons, man. It, you go in. It's super, super quick. The lobby system now, what it looks like in Strive, looks like it's going to be probably a lot more things you got to press. And if your button presses aren't fast, like, so for instance, in Skullgirls, for me to get a, a match, all I got to do is down, 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 X, X, I'm in. That's right. all, right? Like five buttons, right? That's how quick your experience should be when it comes to getting into a new game. It shouldn't be a long, I got to go into somebody's lobby. Oh, uh, I got to get, I, I got I got in the lobby. Now I got to pull my sword. I got I to gotta fight. All this crap, man. And so... Also, what they did is, I don't know if you know, but from what I heard, when you get to a certain floor in the lobby system, like imagine there's 10 floors mm -hmm. and you're on the 10th floor and that's where the really top players go. You cannot go down in the floors. So you have to stay on that same floor. Some people, like other people that are in lower floors can go up to your floor and they can play you at that floor. So if you were in the middle, you can't play people. I believe you can't go down is what I'm saying, but you can only go up or something like it's a very weird way. Uh, it's probably a lot simpler and I could be just getting it wrong, but it's a very weirder way since they took out uh, the ranked system mm -hmm. since there's no rank. And in my head, I think I mentioned it before how they all just suck. So in the end, it's just going to be like another obtuse way of doing ranks. Like before they had like colors. So like in the blaze blue ga games, you have color like, oh, you're a green block and then you turn into a light blue block and then 
then ultimate like the highest level is a pink block mm. some stupid crap like that and yo like so much things that man right quick man i got a beef with character trailers i got i got a big beef with him and strive is just showing me my biggest beef with them nothing in it just gameplay i like that but it's like what is who the hell is this character you show me giovanna okay she got a wolf and she kicks who the hell is this female right who is this woman i don't know who this character is in tekken and I, I you know i will even say it right here smash ultimate probably tekken 7 and smash ultimate probably got the best character trailers out there man but see i think that the problem with tekken 7 is that they don't do it for every character so you remember the leroy trailer oh man that was cold as hell man and then in the smash i, I don't know if you saw the steve trailer for the minecraft yeah, guy i did from the first 10 seconds of like the trailer, you can tell this is the character. This is his world. This is who this character is from just that opening trailer, from a little bit more, a little bit more seasoning in the trailers, man. Cause like the way Strive shows it, I ain't even got no voice. I just get a soundtrack. I just see them fighting a dummy. Like, come on, man. Like, I feel like they give me more. You know what I'm saying? Give me a little bit more with the characters to entice me to buy it. I haven't seen one character trailer where I'm like, damn, I want to buy that character. Man, when Tekken 7 came out, I dropped Tekken. I wanted to play Leroy, man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I saw him, I was like, yo, that character is sick as hell. I think, I don't know if you know about the musician called T-Pain, but he even cosplay. <laughs> oh yeah, I remember that, I remember that. Bro, see, he don't even know who the hell Leroy is, but he cosplayed him. Mm -hmm. So what that tell me? They know how to advertise their characters. Same thing with the Smash games, man. Do you know, did you ever see the trailer, the Smash Ultimate trailer with Terry Bogart in it? I don't think I saw the actual Oh, trailer. man, Mac, you got to see it after this. So what happens in the trailer is that they're all trying to get the, the characters from uh, like KOF characters or I think it's Fatal Fury or something or whatever. Yeah. SNK. They're all trying to get the invitation, the little Smash invitation that they do. And it's all flying out of their hands. And it's funny because they stylized it in a way of like the older SNK games, like the 90s mm, uh, that's pixel sick. art. Yeah, yeah, man. So they did all of this stuff just to show you that Terry was coming. And you know what was also cool? You didn't know who was going to get the invitation in that trailer. So it gave you that that feeling of, ooh, who is it? Who right. is it? Now I'm more interested. I'm invested. And that was a really cool thing that they did with that. They even did it like they'll do like these specific character trailers for every – like. Like they did it for like older characters too, like Little Mac when he came in for like Smash Four, and it was his own little animation and everything. They did it for like Joker from Persona. I don't know if you saw that one, but they did this whole thing where he's like, "Hey, Joker, they got us in Smash." And they, like, yo, they put so much effort into like the character trailers, but like Strive, and I've seen like, "Hey, man, I'll even say I'll put my favorite game down the bus, Skullgirls, man." And they, dude, they just show the character like the the character on the reel, and they just show what the character does. And I'm like, "Come on, man." See, in the case of Skullgirls, it's fine because they're dirt poor indie game, right? <laughs> indie game studio. They made like $5 per purchase, right? Right. In the case of Strive, man, that's a $60 game, man. You got to show me a little bit more. You got to show me some seasoning, man. I want some flavor with my eggs and potatoes, man. Some seasoning, some salt and pepper, man. Make it look cool. Like the Leroy tra trailer was sick. I'd even say the Kunimitsu trailer was a little bit cool. It was kind of dry, though, but... It was cooler, you know what I'm saying? Like it showed a whole new stage, and the stage looked beautiful. Mm -hmm. The Geese Power trailer was really cool, and Akuma entering the game in general was like this whole like I don't know this whole story, this character arc. Yep, you got to really put in more with your game, man. They're not. I feel like it's just gonna come out like any other like anime fighting game, man. It's gonna have a story mode versus mode, online shop. That's it, really. It's just gonna be any other game, man, with the release. Yeah, they're they're making it very difficult to want to support this game like wholeheartedly i still think i will probably purchase it a, at a point in time just because the fact that they did went they did they did go with rollback and i do want to support rollback next yeah game. seriously man. especially if it's I, good but everything yeah, else man. man like all the decisions that are coming out after the rollback announcement and implementation it's just like man you're making it difficult for me to really just try to get on board it's like i'm on the ship but man the, the plank is right there like i'm i'm ready to bounce <laughs> i i probably will get it too but i'm not gonna get it at full price man there's yeah i think i'll wait i can't bit. do that man. yeah man i just cannot do that that thing's gonna come out full price if it's gonna if i'm buying it at a full price it has to come with everything and i'm supposed to spend at least 100 hours in that damn thing mm. it's got to be like super freaking good man because i haven't paid anything at full price as we said earlier i guess we'll wait until april 9th and try it out by the way, be, before we move on to the topic of the week, I can hear my roommate. He's uh, he's Chima I, I call it Chimaning, where he plays. <laughs> <laughs> he 
he plays competitive games online, mostly like shooters, Call of Duty and Overwatch. Oh, man. And when he loses, he says, he's like, oh, come on. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> so I can hear him tremoning on there. So if hopefully right, I can... Right. I can take that out when I edit this thing, but I just find it funny. <laughs> He's just, oh, come man. on. <laughs> All right, Pringle, we got the fighting game topic of the week, and this one is has to do with feedback from last podcast. So I took a little bit of an issue with some of the things that this particular person <laughs> has said, but it brought up a bit of a topic that I figured, hey, why not dive into? It is somewhat of a slow week as far as news. We only had two items, so let's let's talk about some of this stuff. So the TLDR on this whole thing is it's time for the FGC to grow up, according to this person. So user Davis1228 on YouTube had some feedback for us here at FGC Hollywood as he detailed some of his thoughts in the comment section of episode 6 of FGC Hollywood, a fighting game podcast. Davis1228 starts off by saying this, quote, What's the deal with people in the FGC and the aversion to the idea of being cleaner, more respectable, and more approachable in speech and conduct, giving, quote, suit and tie such a negative connotation? Why does, quote unquote, dignified have to be considered boring? He says, having personality is not mutually exclusive with being crass, vulgar, swearing like sailors, like sailors, and those things definitely are not synonymous with being adults. And then he gets to a bit of a... Yeah, this man went into some life stuff, yes, man. It is, it is a bit of a dissertation. Okay, I just want to touch on this a little bit. He said something here is that those two things aren't mutually exclusive so you don't have to be basically a jerk in order to have grassroots in the fgc i agree they're not mutually exclusive you can be nice and still have grassroots values i don't think you have to have completely buttoned up with no grassroots in order to get to a point of what he calls quote-unquote maturity i don't think those two things are the same why like so the question would be to him is that why would he correlate maturity towards not being vulgar, crass, and swearing like sailors. Why is that there? Why is the cor correlation there with maturity? You know, you could be mature, but you could still swear like a sailor. Mm -hmm. I've seen people do it. I've worked in the Marine Corps, and a lot of those guys are very mature, but they curse a lot. <laughs> right. And you know, and you could still be vulgar, but there's ways to go about vulgarity as well as being crass and all these type of things. You know, sometimes you got to tell somebody like it is. I don't think there's that much of an aversion when there's the idea of just being cleaner and more respectful, respectable and more approachable in speech and con. I mean, like, I feel like those things are like, those are like the difference between somebody, I don't even know, like somebody wearing like casual and business attire. That's what just what they're wearing, I'd say. I feel like there's more to it than just just that when it comes to especially maturity. Like, cause like for me, immaturity is more like a, like someone just, just being a dick for no reason. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? When we're, when, when you hear commentate commentators joking and having a good time, making all these kinds of stupid, stupid remarks and stuff like that, they can still, they can still be mature. Like for instance, like Yipes pretty much does it. He's like, he wrote the Bible on it. I'd say right. this dude can be auto, he can be crab vulgar and sailor. Everybody love this guy. Right. Mm -hmm. And when it comes down to like evil. He could still kind of do those things, but he controls it in a different way. To me, it reads as somewhat of a personal attack against grassroots. That's kind of how I yeah, see it. Yeah. Like, I don't see grassroots as a bad thing. It seems to me like he sees a negative connotation with grassroots, and he thinks that if you get rid of grassroots, you're getting rid of being crass and vulgar and everything you don't want in a quote-unquote professional setting. See, I don't, when I think grassroots, I think of tradition. I don't think of being toxic. Some people might, but I don't see it that mm -hmm. way. If you say it like that, right? It's like, yo, it's really just hanging out with your boys and having a good time. Mm -hmm. That's the best way to look at it as. That's the, that's, that's how it starts though. That's the grassroots, the grass starting from the goddamn bottom of the, the earth. What you, what you walk on, basically the kind of like the beginning, like the dirt. And then the grass comes up from the floor. Right? It's, it's how it starts, man. It's like. Playing with your boys, you would have like eight people, and then you'd have one dude talking about the match on the side if he's even commentating, and then it's like seven other people playing, and that's that's a big that's the soul, man. You know what I'm saying? That's that's a big part of it. But when you dress those same dudes, and you put them in suits, and you 
and they're speaking a certain way, are they really like they're bo- are they boys? You know what I'm saying? Like, are they do they sound like boys? Do you hang with your homeboys and then you talk in a specific way, very, very correct, dignified, absolutely no slang? It does it seems kind of out of place in that regards because doing those type of things, like speaking very dignified, that's like that's like you going for a job interview, man. You know what I'm saying? Mm. You don't talk to those people. You don't talk to your friends like you're going to a job interview. That's weird. Yeah, I mean, and that's what I mean when I say grassroots in the FGC. It's it's a level of comfortability where is if I try to watch like LCS, right? If I'm trying to watch League, they're, it's kind of stiff to me. Whereas with the FGC, the commentary and the production it's it's loose right and it's we'll, we'll get to it i I've, I've, i compiled a list of things that i think if you get rid of grassroots you're losing out on these things as well because they're just you're not going to be able to to have them as, at least in the same capacity but this ain't like other esports like we're just not and i think it's okay to accept that it doesn't mean we're toxic people it just means mm-hmm. we're a little rough around the edges and that's okay Football fans and MMA fans aren't the same, aren't, aren't cut from the same cloth, right? But I, okay, so Davis here said he he followed up and he quoted me saying when when I said on the podcast, I said, you know, we're adults here, we can do what we want or we can say what we want. When I said that, I we didn't weren't even talking about Lee Chung and Yipes. That wasn't during the grassroots talk. That was actually when I was talking about our Discord and how we were getting the community moderation on there. That's why I, I took it away. So that was out of context. I don't know why he, he put that in there. However, he said this. We'd be in a better state if the majority in the FGC would stop hiding behind grassroots spirit, romanticizing the edgy behavior from their teenage days in the arcade with rose-tinted glasses, and actually hold everyone in the FGC to a higher standard. Okay, again, I don't know. Like, we just don't see the, the term grassroots spirit as the same thing he seems to have a negative connotation to that i see it as a positive thing here's some grassroots moment moments that i think won't be held in the same capacity if we didn't have that grassroots spirit obviously moment 37 moment 37 if that's in an esports venue you don't have the energy of the crowd you don't have the reaction of justin wong and Daigo being so close to each other, right? They're not on opposite ends of, of the, the arcade mm-hmm. or they're not on completely opposite ends of the building sometimes with the e- esports. They're right next to each other. It's close. They're surrounded by people. There's an energy there. The second one is is Dogra versus Galileo, plays Blue Evo 2014. The crowd is almost like collapsing on each other because everybody wants to get so close, right, to the stage to, to see and the energy is electric, but also the facts. Dude, I don't know if you saw the, the amount of, like, degenerate signs they have in the crowd. <laughs> like, just yeah, man, anime signs, awesome. weeb signs. That's grassroots, man. That's, like, it seems like it's unprofessional or whatever, but, like, it makes that moment even more spectacular, even if you, you don't agree with it. It does. It just does. One of my favorite was uh, K. Brad's and Dominion's entrances at CEO 2015. I don't remember if you remember those entrances that they, that they did. I don't remember K. Brad. Whoa, whoa. Go ahead. Yeah. So K. Brad, he came into like Steve Austin. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> it was hilarious. Yeah. And he, he body slammed that dude. And it was, it was, it was pretty funny. Like, it, but you won't, you won't get that, right? Because it's unprofessional. It's too grassroots or whatever. And then Dominion's was hilarious because they turned off all the lights and then he snuck in. <laughs> oh, I love it. This is my favorite, dude. He just came right next to him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, Majin Obama's This Is FGC speech that we were talking about last week at Combo Breaker 2018 where he was, you know, he kept spouting. He was, he was on there with Sarvets after the Sarvets All-Star ex- exhibition and how he turned it up from, he's just like, hey, look, we're, let's try to do this esports. And then he was just like, ah, scratch that. And he went ahead and was just like, you know, this isn't esports, this is FGC. One of the more recent ones is Ryan Hart and Rip smack talking at the desk during the Tekken World Tour LCQ in 2018. Do you remember where they were challenging each other and just yeah, kind of Yeah, I love that one. They, they, I heard that Ryan Hart was like, I didn't actually like, we didn't actually think this would do anything, but we, <laughs> they set it up and we did it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, that couldn't happen in a professional setting like yeah, League man. or Overwatch because those guys have to be cut to a script because there's so much money backed into that. Yeah, you're right. But it would have taken out the personality of those guys if there was just suit and ties. You understand? Like, that's why Grassroots is so interesting because we end up getting another event 
for that smack talk that happened at that event like <laughs> yeah it was funny that and yo you you're right though that you mentioned it, the script thing because when you think about it a lot of sometimes those commentators they sometimes may just be doing it like not even getting paid to do that work sometimes and if they're getting paid it might not even be a, a significant amount of money but when you think about like those esports guys those those guys probably got like legitimate salaries or something mm. like that man yeah. they're working in a bigger event and they constantly work in these events where the prize pool is like millions of dollars so you have to be cookie cutter and buy the book if you got all that money behind you right the fgc is you know we don't have that so we can let loose a little bit it's nice and the, the other two that i put on here first of all punko taking a shirt off pretty much every tournament <laughs> <laughs> anytime he was mad it's like oh the shirt's off i was like bruh that's a, a grassroots aspect that we allow in tournaments that like wouldn't fly if we were come on man suit and tie. yeah yo it wouldn't even fly because he couldn't even wear the suit and tie he'd take it <laughs> off so there you go man <laughs> And then the last one, which I love, is the ATL Tekken crew just, you know, cheering and yelling pretty much oh, yeah, at every like tournament for every one of those guys. Like, it doesn't matter who's playing. They're always there making just a ruckus. And I, I mean, that's you couldn't have that. You, you would have to try to contain those guys if we were buttoned up. And I don't want that. Mm -hmm. It's true, man. I, yeah, I just wanted to kind of cover that because uh, I, I, I really don't believe that grassroots is a bad thing. And I just kind of wanted to clarify that point. But I mean, hey, Davis, yeah. one two two eight. He's entitled to his own opinion, and uh, yeah, I respect it. I respect that opinion. I just don't necessarily agree with it. All right, the non-fighting game topic of the week. I actually, I think I'm gonna roll this topic back for next week in case oh, we have another slow. <laughs> in, case, in case we have right. another slow week, uh, because I think we can always come back to this one. It's not very time sensitive. So, but there are a lot of game sales here, and since I do want to edit this podcast fairly quickly because some of these i don't know when they're going to end i kind of wanted to get to those also i don't know if you know us bringle we have a baker's dozen 13 questions so let's get to the game sales i know we can wrap up with the questions so no playstation 4 game sales no xbox one right. game sales but a bunch of steam sales so and these are all going to be good through october 29th and they're through game billet so that's game b-i-l-l-e-t so basically you buy a code and then they mail you the key and then you can play it on steam or windows so we have some bandai namco and wb sales going on so let's read these dragon ball fighters fighters edition is 13 dollars 95 dragon ball fighters fighter z pass is 13 dollars 95 dragon ball fighters fighter z pass 2 boy, oh boy. is 10 dollars 95 and dragon ball fighters Ultimate Edition is $14.95. All right, now we have some Soul Calibur sales. So Soul Calibur 6 is $8.95. Season 1 Pass is $12.95. Season 2 Pass is $30.39. What in the world? Yeah, or the Deluxe Edition is $90.95. I don't understand. Unless the Deluxe Edition doesn't come with Season 2 Pass, why wouldn't you just get the Deluxe Edition? That's weird. Yeah, I, and damn, dude, I didn't even know Soul Calibur was that dirt cheap. Uh, uh. Yeah, so if you want to get some Soul Calibur, that's a fairly decent deal. I don't know why that Season 2 pass is so expensive. Yeah, yeah, looking like Grand Blue. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, Tekken 7, another game that's frequently on sale, is $8.95. The Season 1 pass is $10.95. Season 2 Pass is $12.95, and the Ultimate Edition is $19.95. And I added some of these because you're a JRPG fan, so why not? We got oh, yeah. Tales yeah, of man. Berseria <laughs> is $6.95, and hey. this is the one we were talking about a couple episodes ago, Tales of Vesperia, but this time it's the Definitive Edition, available for $10.29. And winding up is WB sale. So we got Injustice Gods Among Us Ultimate Edition, $4.85. Injustice 2, $9.70. MKX is $4.85. And MKXL is $8.73. Where do they get these prices from? It's weird. Oh, yeah. Yo, for real. But I was going to ask, what the hell is the L and XL? Like, is that extra large? Or... <laughs> I think. <laughs> I don't know. I really don't know. Oh, man. Uh, one game on Switch is on sale and is Mortal Kombat 11 Standard Edition. It is $19.99. Wow. And uh, finally, Pringle, I had to, you know how hard you have to dig to find like when the deal ends on the Switch store? It's so counterintuitive, but I found yeah, it. Yeah, of so. course it is. 
Uh, yeah, so Mortal Kombat 11 Standard Edition is $20 until November 2nd, 2020. I put a note here, Pringle. So when I go through these sales and I go, I look on PlayStation, I look on Steam, I look on all these different websites. Man, fighting games get like no respect in the category section. <laughs> they're they're uh, under what multiplayer, right? Yeah. They aren't under fighting games. <laughs> there is yeah, no fighting game. There's no category for fighting games, dude. <laughs> That's bullcrap. Yeah, I, mean, I don't understand that. That's like a whole other genre of stuff. Like even arena fighters could be paired up in the fighting game no. stuff, but like nah, man, they just put it on their multiplayer. They just it's put weird. it under action. It's like this. Okay, come on. <laughs> yeah. Man, no respect. Not at all, man. Not at all. No respect. Now we get to our listener questions. Again, we said we had a thirteen baker's dozen, so it's nice. The Discord really helped us out, and. Uh, our YouTube comments, though. Of course, every week we start with this one. So Zio on Patreon asks, <laughs> where is KOF 15? Sorry, <laughs> force of habit. And he said, it's time for the Q fight music rollback showdown. He says, would Plus R getting rollback in a week and 2002 UM already having gone through the 64-bit beta and 32-bit beta, it seems the appropriate time to compare the two games under a few key parameters as to help listeners choose one to engage into and stop and stop playing trash fighters with broken rollback netcode. That is, <laughs> that is worse oh, than delay. In, and then he put in quotations. He's in the team hate Street Fighter V. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And he referenced it too. He said every reference to Street Fighter V is purely intended. Stop it, people. Get help. <laughs> so... Can you compare the following aspects of the two games and choose a winner in each category? The categories are visual design, animation, roster, gameplay, ease of access, as in how hard it is, or as in how hard it is to feel okay at the game. Add extra categories if I miss something. And so I added original soundtrack. So you have yet to play KOF 2002 UM, I've right? I've a bit, but yeah, I've yet to play that one, mm -hmm. so... So I'll say I've played both. Obviously, I've only played Plus R offline. I have not played the delay netcode yet, or I'm not planning on to, but I will play the beta when that comes out for GGPO. And 2002, I have experience playing the netcode for that. I'll say if if GGPO is implemented very well in Plus R, it's a very compelling game to pick up. If I'm going to mm -hmm. rank these categories, it, it's really hard. I was actually thinking about this. So visual design, I would probably give that to plus R just mm. because I think it, it looks a little smoother. It's a little better in the visual aspect than KOF 2002. Animation, uh, yeah, I think I would also go with plus R on that one. The roster, this is tough. This is really tough because of how unique Guilty Gear oh, characters God, are. Character. Yeah, man. But there are so many characters in KOF 2002, mm -hmm. and they're unique within themselves. I would say just with the amount that you're given with 2002, is I would give that the edge. So roster goes to 2002. Gameplay is really, really difficult. It's like, oh, man. I, I, they're both so good. But, man, they're, <sighs> there's something special about 2002, man. I, I can't pinpoint it's it. It's got really. that magic. Yeah. Man. I think it's got the magic. I don't know what it is, but the old KOF games all got the magic, dude. It's really, really good, but man, that's such a close race. Uh, that's, I would say 2002 wins by just a tiny, tiny bit. It's not, it's not a huge discrepancy there. Ease of access. I would also say 2002. Yeah. So plus R, I wouldn't recommend that game to beginners so much, but you can mm -hmm. get a, a hold of it if you play it long enough but as far as feeling okay i would say 2002 is probably a little easier and, and if that's your if that's your goal 2002 yeah and then lastly ost man as good as 2002's soundtrack is i think one of uh, probably my favorite fighting game soundtrack of all time is plus ours it's, it's accent course so yeah man pot steam god i mean Damn, there's so many of... yeah so many so good i mean they're so good yeah, dude. Yeah. yeah, I uh I think since but see I haven't played um UM as much. So I, I think out of all that stuff, I'd probably just say the I'd probably agree with you on the on the roster because I feel I've seen how much characters are in UM a lot, right? A lot. Like, I don't know how many exactly, but a lot. There is a lot, and I would say that because of the rosters in KO are interesting because you're forced to play three characters. Mm. So like that's always gonna be like three whole ass characters too. They're they're not cut in half, man. These are three whole ass characters. Yep. <laughs> so I I probably give it there too as well. 
And yeah, I, I think I just kind of agree with what you said. Ease of I, I like the gameplay from Plus R. I liked a lot, but I know that the ease of access with that can conflict with the gameplay because like Plus R is not easy at all, man. There, there's a lot of things in that game compared to like KOF. Those games are like you kind of see is what you get. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of depth to them, of course, but there's not like thousands of things that you need. Like there is so many moves in each character in Plus R. And, like, I think, what is it, the FRCs make everything harder to do? Yeah, there's a lot more. So, I don't know. I kind of agree with what you said, too, man. Brute Slayer 17 on Patreon asks, wouldn't it be cool for fighting game companies to recognize that they have had great music in their games? The point I'm getting at is, should these games, an example, Tekken, Guilty Gear, Street Fighter, etc., have live concerts for their popular music tracks? I got this idea from the Near Automata concert since the man who composed the music work on Tekken 1 through 6. Dang, you didn't know that. I didn't know that, yeah. Interesting. It would be cool if they had concerts. You know, they, they do concerts for smaller games too, like Undertale had a concert, right? Did it? Oh, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> I can picture that. That's probably, that's actually probably fun. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I like the music a lot in that game too, man. But yeah, it would be cool to have, especially like a rock concert, like Guilty Gear rock concert. That'd be dope. See, now that would have been great for their marketing. <laughs> <laughs> like that for Strive, so they could show out some of the new songs and some of the old songs because they have the band. Those dudes seem like they want to play Guilty Gear music all freaking day long. Mm-hmm. I think that would be a pretty cool idea. I've seen those near concerts, man. And I had a friend that was talking to me about like virtual reality stuff. And he mentioned how you could go to like those virtual reality concerts. So that's still that's another great cool idea. Mm. I think stuff like that could popularize the games more and it could help their marketing. In the end, it would help them in general and it would get more fans invested in it. Yeah, absolutely. We'll see. I mean, maybe something like that could happen within the next generation of fighting games. I mean, let's get through a pandemic first, huh? <laughs> yeah, I know, right? It's true, man. <laughs> but I would say a a digital online concert would still be yeah. kind of something else. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? That would be a start because you you don't have it doesn't have to be live people there, but digitally, hey, there there that's a cool idea. And the virtual reality thing is another thing that's like, hey man, that gives 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 everyone an option to at least see what it is about. And then you can get people to do it physically later down the line. Mm-hmm. All right. Last one comes from or last one from Patreon comes from Jam and he asks what title is your one night stand of fighting games? He says, hot, fiery lust, but it just didn't last. <laughs> I kicked it to the curb. <laughs> this one was tough for me to think of. I was, I was thinking of like a game that I liked, but just didn't play for very long. The last one that I can think of was Million Arthur, Arcana Blood. I think we spoke about that mm. game a couple times. Yo, I played a little bit of it, man. Oh, yeah? Uh, it's it's cool. Yeah, I, I kind of like... There's so much assist, though. That's like way too goddamn much. <laughs> like, what the hell is all this crap, man? There's all these, like, like 40 of them, I swear. <laughs> but, like, yeah, it's it's cool. I don't I don't know if there's, like, a character I could kind of use, but I, I played it for, like, 15, 10 minutes, and I was like, oh, this is pretty cool. It feels good. Like, I, it it, does I definitely good. like the feel. It feels really good, yeah. I kind of stopped playing it because... I couldn't find a character, like like you just said, I couldn't find a character that really speaks to me. Mm-hmm. And again, you know, delay net code. And the fact that just there's not a lot of people playing that game. So I didn't really want to become invested too much because I didn't know, I knew I wasn't going to have a lot of competition. Uh, Yo, I can't think of it though, man. I don't, I don't know. That's a good one, Jam. That's a good one. I was going to actually say maybe Guilty Gear Rev too, man. Like, yeah, I think so. at this point, yeah, man, I don't want nobody knowing I play that game. <laughs> <laughs> I play it on locals, but... By myself, I play and I'm like, dang, this is a like I start doing all the fun May stuff and hitting people with it. I'm like, this is a fun game. And then like I find a lot of the meta characters and I'm like, ooh, I'm about to drop this hole, man. I'm about <laughs> to drop this hole. <laughs> so I, I think Rev 2 probably might be it. Or uh I even say I uh, I was gonna say Unil, but like I, I, I never told you, man, but I don't really like Unil that much, man. <clears throat> I wish I did, but I just didn't like him. You talking about Undernight in general or just EL? Oh uh, yeah, in general, I've tried. Yeah. I've tried every single one of them, man, and I never got into it. I tried, man, but like one of the things that I never liked so much about Undernight is like uh, I don't like how it feels. Like every time I just knock somebody down, I just kind of like do the same oaky stuff. Depending on the character, mm-hmm. it felt like uh, whenever I played it, I felt like I just didn't have like the damage ratio isn't too different amongst like the board, I guess. And I don't know. I tried it. I tried so like I tried so many different characters, and I just couldn't get down with it. It was weird. 
it didn't click very well with me. Yeah, I, I, I could see that happening, especially. So I'll be honest, the only reason why I play under night is because the Kotsky's in the game. If, <laughs> yeah, man, I, yeah, dude, I, yeah, uh, I could see that. Yep. I mean, if a Kotsky wasn't a part of under night, I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't play that game. I would still think it's cool, but f- dude, I don't play uh, it, That usually never happens for me to play only one yeah. character in a fighting game, like, and he, him being the sole reason why I'm sticking around. Like <laughs> usually I can yeah, find but... like, yeah, I can find a character I can mess around with here and there. Dude, I've messed around with the entire cast. I was like, I think I, they're not they're not very inspiring to be honest. I was like, oh, yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. Like, whenever I played it in Neil games, I I don't know what it is. Like, so like I got I tried getting really into it. I played Nana say for goodness sake, oh what was God. wrong with me? But I played Nana say right, and I got really into it. And I went into a local at the time, and they had like their monthly tournament. And I, I just like I don't get it. Like, it's like the pressure felt the same. Reverse beats is a thing, but like as soon as I use up my reverse beats. We're just blocking again. Mm-hmm. Or like if I can't open them up, I, I just couldn't open them up. There was nothing that inherently made me feel like the game was different. The Oki wasn't like, because what I like about Guilty Gear is kind of like the Oki. Sometimes I hate it, but sometimes it's fun because you can get very creative with the Oki situations. Right. And it like opens up like a whole new world of different things. But then whenever I played Unil, I was like, why don't I just play like Blaze Blue or like Melty Blood? <laughs> so I always felt like. Yeah, that that's that's true. The one thing I liked about Honor Knight is obviously Akatsuki, but the other the other thing mm-hmm. was the the fact that you're weaponizing momentum. And yeah. I, I like I like the fact that you're fighting for grid and chain shift is a thing. Yeah, yo, yo, right. And I will say that one thing that was cool about the game was um the color palettes. Oh man, I love those. They had some gangster ass color palettes, mm. man. <laughs> so good. <laughs> yeah, it is it's it's a different game. But yeah, like I, like I said, if if Akatsuki was, you know, what was crazy? I was doing some research back in the Undernight, or rather the EL days. the The top two most popular characters in Uniel were Eltnum and Akatsuki, the two characters that don't belong to really? Undernight and Bertha. <laughs> the two guest wow. characters. I thought it would. I thought it would be Yuzo and um, what's that chick? A little shield and the sword, and she's kind of like a gorilla. Oh, you're talking about Wagner. She wasn't. Yeah, she wasn't Wagner. in EL yet. Oh, okay. Yeah. Where are we at? Okay, we're on. So I, so when I solicited questions this week, I was just like, hey, it might be a slow week. Just send us anything. <laughs> we'll take anything. Yeah, all right. So Heinz the Rhyme Bomber on YouTube asked, who would win? Korean cheesecake Oreo cubes or Japanese cheesecake Kit Kats? So I added some Ooh. pictures here. And just to describe this to if you're listening. So the Korean cheesecake Oreo cubes... They're, they just look like a bunch of white cubes that look like you, just regular cheesecake. And they have like the Oreo powder on them. And they're maybe like thumb sized. And the Japanese cheesecake Kit Kats, it just looks like a white Kit, Kit Kat. And it comes in like a little bar, like the regular Kit Kat bar. But I'm assuming it's just cheesecake inside. I'm going to I'm gonna say that's a hard pass with those Oreos, <laughs> man. Oreos tend to see this is where Oreos lose in this situation. They are so much more dense in calories. Mm. The only, the good thing, though, I would say about them is that they're like vegan. So mm. if you, yeah, yeah, they're 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 vegan, dude. That that cream that since I don't know what the hell that cream is. Maybe the cheesecake Oreo cubes aren't, but uh, yeah, the, the normal Oreos usually are vegan. It's just soy, it's like whatever it is, but it's like a soy cream type yeah. of thing. But usually, I'll take a hard pass to those Oreos, man. They're too full of calories. Those Japanese cheesecake Kit Kats look more like. Japanese snacks, you know what I'm saying? Right. American snack. Those those Korean cheesecake Oreo cubes look like American snack. I don't really <laughs> like that. I think I would probably would go with the Kit Kats as well, but the uh, just as an experiment and because I want to see what an Oreo and cheesecake would be like. I kind of I'm tempted to try it, so I think I would go with the Oreos. Oh man, you'd gorge yourself on Oreos <laughs> and feel horrible afterwards. Yeah, is that how it's yeah. gonna go? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would feel terrible afterwards. All right, Alex Rodriguez Rodriguez on YouTube asks, what is something you wished your favorite fighting game had? Like a feature or character in a previous iteration? Um, I would say if we're talking about season three going on to four and Tekken seven, I would like I would like probably sidestepping mobility and tag two to come back. And then I mean backdashing and sidestepping mobility to come back. Yeah. Oh man. Actually, dude, I I won't even say my favorite fighting game because, well, if I wanted to take something, it would probably be Big Band from Skullgirls. But <laughs> I would say to add on to what you said is, hell yeah, man, I would enjoy Tekken 7 if the movement was more of a, of a thing. Because I feel like the movement isn't that much of a thing in Tekken 7 sometimes. Stiff. And I've seen, 
Uh, yeah, I've seen the older Tekkies, though. They, they, they have, like, lead boots in them games. <laughs> <laughs> that game would be so much more enjoyable for me if there was more of an emphasis with movement because movement was essentially the big gap between skill level. Because in Tekken, combos are so easy. You know what I'm saying? They're super easy. Mm-hmm. They're like button presses and maybe a dash or two in there. But, like, the movement is where everything gets super hard. If you can't hit somebody because they just – Ooh, ooh, they, they just whip everything. They just dancing all over the screen. It's like hell yeah, man. That Tekken would be great if I if I had tag two movement. Yeah, man, I, I think I'd like it a lot more. El Usuario Perdido. I hopefully I didn't butcher that name completely. Uh, yeah, no, you got it kind of right. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> close enough. On YouTube, ask what do you do when you main a character with little to no helpful information and want to improve him? How do you overcome that barrier? So is that like a niche character, I'm assuming? Because, I mean, most characters online have a lot of guides and yeah. combos and stuff. So It's hard at this point. Anytime I pick up a game, I'm already late. So, like, all the stuff is online. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even have to look for it. I just Google combos for the character and I find it, dude. I will say, like, I've done it a couple times where I've picked up characters from the ground up. I haven't mastered them, but I've gotten fairly comfortable. And you just experiment, right? You just start. What I would do is I would just look for different positions so corner mid screen air depending on the game counter hit off of a grab there's so many i mean fighting games are so intricate there's so many different mm-hmm. positions but i would just experiment with okay what can i link here what can i do here let's say oh, and then let's say if i end this here with a knockdown do i have okie setup you just have to experiment with so many different tools and different places and it takes a it takes a while, but honestly, if if you can't find anything online, that's the best way to do it. You just have to put in the time and experiment. Yeah, cause I was about to say that's how they did it back then, man. Mm-hmm. They ain't had no guys, man. How they yo? What what threw me off, man, is how people figured out infinite back then, man. <laughs> like how the hell y'all figured it out? Like, have you ever seen? Uh, I don't know if you ever seen. You know who Sako is? Do you know who Sako yeah. is? So he found an infinite in in Darkstalkers back in like the nineties. And I was like, I'm like over here, like, how the hell did they figure that out? Because like, not only was it harder because you didn't have it at home, but you had to go to an arcade, so you had to spend quarters. From what I heard, is sometimes what they would do is that they would have like, uh, they would put like a rock or something like that on the other stick or something to make the the stick move a certain way, or like they would do all kinds of weird ghetto ass crap to <laughs> make it so that they can use the second player, and then they would lab with that, and they would just keep putting in quarters over and over again, just trying to lap one combo down. That's nuts, man. That is nuts. The way, I mean, you really do experiment. That's how you overcome that barrier. You just keep kind of like punching in. You just pretty much slam your head against the wall until something works. <laughs> yeah. And and then keep track of like what you do. Mm-hmm. And then keep track of like, okay, this did this, this much damage, but it didn't have as much of a carry to the corner or this does this much damage, but it left me with a good Oki setup or whatever. There's a lot of things you have to keep track of, but it's just a part of the process of kind of building the character to be in tune with how you want to play. Like with Labrys, mm-hmm. I would always sacrifice high damage within neutral for setup because mm-hmm. I would rather keep playing offense versus doing a lot of damage. And then now I have to play defense because it was one of her weakest points right like she can't play defense this is terrible so yeah i sacrificed whatever 200 points of damage in order to knock you down and put up the uh the spike on the ground so you have to stay still yeah hey yeah there you go man. sonic puff on youtube asks pad keyboard or arcade stick what are you playing on pringle uh arcade man i can't touch anything else now man arcade stick yeah i agree i've, I've converted as well yeah, man. When I I never played actually on anything else, <laughs> so I I first started on arcade stick. But I would say, like objectively speaking, your cheapest is keyboard, mm-hmm. but that hurts your fingers a lot. Pads are cheap and they're good for that. But the problem is that people break through those pads really quickly. Arcade sticks can be much more expensive. You can find ways to make it cheap, like build your own, or just buy one offline. Like you could buy, you know, you go to Facebook marketplaces or any craigslist or some crap like ebay yeah. you could buy one and the good thing about arcade sticks is that they last such a long time yeah and you kind of need if you want to play in tournaments depending on the console like let's say you like playing on 360 but mm-hmm. everything is played on ps4 do you have to get a converter 
to play. That is so true. So yeah. it's kind of another hassle. Whereas most sticks, if you get a modern, they can play on the modern consoles. Yeah. So I've played on all three of those growing up. I've played on pad. I played on keyboard and I played on arcade stick. Right now I'm, I'm playing on a Korean stick, but I will say it's very, our case stick is very comfortable for me, especially a Korean lever now because I mostly play Tekken and I've transitioned to playing 2d games on Korean lever. And I don't find it to be that difficult. I will say touching on keyboard though. Do you know who Sua is? She's a Korean variety streamer. Mm, not sure. What about her? So she is, she's just a Korean variety streamer, but she has a very extensive background in KOF, King of Fighters. Mm-hmm. And actually, I'll just say this. In my opinion, the best fighting game player on the planet is, or female fighting game player player on the planet is a variety streamer. <laughs> like, <laughs> I do. like she That's plays right, Dark dude. Souls and she plays other things, but... If you watch her play KOF 13, 2002, 98, that chick is a savage. I mean, that's a bad woman right there. Like, first of all, <laughs> it, there's a set of her playing against Shao Hai in KOF 13. She's play, it's playing on a keyboard. Oh, wow. And dude, she is matching Shao Hai. And like, that's, he's like one of the top Chinese player players yeah, for yeah, KOF. Yeah, yeah. And she, I mean, she holds her own. Like, she's no slouch. And I really think, like, she doesn't compete as much as the other female fighting game players we have in the scene. But, pff, dude, I mean, talk about, that's that's a bad woman. Like, every time I see her play KOF, I'm like, Jesus, that's nasty. Like, she's just so good. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty sick, man. It's all, it, she's the, she's like that. She got a hidden boss <laughs> yeah. power, man. She, she'd probably be like, if I competed, the world would not be ready for me. So I'm just going to stick to some Dark Souls. She played a little Street Fighter V, and she kind of dabbles in Tekken here and there, but her bread and butter is KOF, like those three yeah. KOFs. She doesn't really play 14 much, but she plays 98, yeah. 2002, and 13, and she's godlike in all three. Oh, I'm going to see that. Yeah, and also- She like, plays on keyboard? She plays Sick. on keyboard, yeah. She's also like a super entertaining streamer. She's just kind of wild. She's, she's like a wild person. But yeah, she's, she's really fun to watch and- uh in my opinion, I think so. When I say the most talented female fighting game player on the planet, I mean she's not the best Tekken player on the planet. She's not the best Street Fighter player on the planet. But I'm saying pound for pound, if we're taking neutral games, right? If I, I think if I took female player X, who's crowned right now, is the best female player on the planet, and I took Sua in a neutral game, I, I'm going with Sua. I think <laughs> when you consider the fundamentals she has that she brings from KOF, and her execution is immaculate. Uh, I, I take her every time. She's uh, she's not. I, I don't think she's not like she's not only one of the best female fighting game players on the planet, or rather the best. I think she's just period like she's just one of the most talented fighting game players on the planet. But just, she's just she she likes playing casually, even though she's so good. Ah, do you know why she doesn't compete, or she just doesn't? She doesn't travel as much, and she, she plays mm. online against you know top level competition in KOF. And she used to play a little bit of Street Fighter, but I think she just likes doing her thing, just streaming on Twitch. And yeah, it's easier. Yeah, you got to travel every freaking week, man. You got people that do that, man. It's tired. Yeah, and I'd also say probably her games aren't out there, so that doesn't yeah. help. I mean, she's she's kind of plays this KOF, and she's not really big on fourteen. She likes the older mm -hmm. ones, so maybe she'll come back with fifteen and she'll start competing again. That'd be sick. Yeah, but no, she's really really good. My money's on her to <laughs> if, if if KO fifteen isn't a gotcha game, let's go, man. Yeah, dude. Oh, and actually speaking of talking about grassroots, that chick is grassroots. That's why I think she's like Oh man. Dude, I mean she talks mad shit, which I love. Oh like, yeah. It's like she's beating on Shao Hai and she's and she's just talking shit. It's just it's awesome. Like I, I don't know. I, I really like it about her because it's not to me that's that's like FGC right there. Hell yeah, man. All right, where we're at here, number eight. Smokeback yeah. official on YouTube asks, is the removal of the unlock character feature after playing arcade mode or story mode and replacing it with buy pack killing fighting games? Hell yeah, it is. Hell yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Ruin, man. It Ruin it. It's, I'm scared. It's terrible. I hate it. Why did they do that? Like, okay, so right quick, I'm going to bring Smash into this. Smash Ultimate did it where you can unlock all the characters, right? I actually hated that process because it wasn't fun. Man, there's like 70 plus characters. What the hell do you think I'm going to do? Spend all this time unlocking characters? Right. That's not fun. Unlocking like 10 characters, all right, but 60, man? <laughs> oh, dude, that's way too much time, man. But I, it definitely ruined it because like so many games in the past just came with all the characters that are, like I said before, they were, you would just re, 
they'd resell you the game in a better like oh this is ultimate but you got all the characters but they took that that took away unlocking the characters too so it's not it's fun unlocking characters man yeah it is remember when cross tekken made you pay for those characters even though they were already on the disc oh yeah i heard about that they were on the discs data right yep yeah that's so grimy man that is grimy thanks capcom all right horseplay on youtube ask worst fighting game you still enjoy playing I, okay, so just by going by the definition of worse, not to say that this game is bad, but I think the other games that I do play are are better. I would say Fantasy Strike. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, I don't think it's like a you... bad game, but it's just out of like KOF 2002 and Plus R and other ones that I play, that would be the worst. That would be at the bottom of that list. I never actually played that game, man. I, I don't think I'll ever bother to. But yeah. I mean, it's free. I should try it out. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's true. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll give it a shot one day. But yeah, man. Yeah. It's all crossplay, which is cool. Yeah, crossplay and rollback. But I can't think of a worse fighting game since I don't play much fighting games anymore. I, I can't really think of anything. I would I, if I was playing BB tag, I'd put that right there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That'd be a fine challenger for that spot. Uh, yeah, I was trying to get into it for a second, and I was like, "Bro, this is so." I was just doing that. I you didn't know the Yakihiko combo where he like he starts getting um, what is it, level five tornado or something mm-hmm. like that? It's called. Yeah, I was just doing that. And all you do is like press A and B and A and B, and I was like, "Wow, this is like this is giving me so much endorphins just from just smashing this button because it's so easy." And do, okay, so I I haven't played Yakihiko and BB tag, but do you when t- in order to get to level five, do you still have to weave in and weave out? Nah, man, you just, I think all you do is just press the buttons and he just gets there. <laughs> oh, man. So, see, in, in Persona, if you want to do that, right, you have to quarter circle forward, weave in, and then quarter circle mm-hmm. back, weave out. And you have to do that over and over and over again. And if you stop doing that, you get out of Cyclone. So you have. Oh, no, not at all, dude. They, they actually made his weaving in weirder. Like, it's actually kind of weird to do. I remember trying it. I think it was pretty weird last I remember. Hmm. All right, born to feel on Discord. Ask after Dragon Ball Fighters, which one will be the fa- flagship team fighter? Battle for the Grid, KOF fifteen, or a new Marvel vs. Capcom? See, this question was a little weird. So I think by he means like a flagship team game. There's so there's a difference between a flagship team game and a flagship tag game. A, yeah. a team game is is king of fighters, but they're all and they all play separately, right? So they. They don't tag in. Well, certain most KOFs don't have tag partners and they don't play with each other. They play separately, but they're on a team. Battle for the Grid is more like Marvel, where it's a tag game and it obviously consists of a team. But a flagship, flagship, that means that everybody plays it or knows of it. I mean, right now... uh... I don't. I don't think there's gonna be an after DBFZ. <laughs> yeah, probably not for a while. I think DBFZ is gonna be the after, if that makes any sense. Dragon Ball Fighters too. Yeah, man. Oh boy. Yeah. But yeah, because like right now there isn't there isn't anything that really is popular and is a, in the tag team game. So unless we get like what like a new Street Fighter Cross Tekken two or some crap like that. Yeah, it would have to be something crazy like that. But I, yeah, I would probably assume, like you said, it would be another Dragon Ball game. All right, Kite on Discord. This is an interesting scenario. It has not so much question. Yeah. It says, if you were trapped on an island for the rest of your lives and you could only have one game of each category, what would it be? And if you have the time or want to, you can explain why you chose game X and the categories over others. The games will have local play, but also have magical, perfect online play, even if they don't in real life. Categories are 2D, 3D, anime, tag, smash, and weapon fighter. If you don't have a choice for a category, feel free to say skip. I'm assuming by smash he means platform fighter, right? Yeah, probably, yeah. I'm going to skip that one. (laughs) Oh, I got you, man. I'm going to get you. I'm going to watch. I'm going to hit you with the... I want more wishes. I want more wishes. Wish. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm gonna hit you if if there was ever a compilation. It was one game though, but a compilation of every Dragon Quest game. Let's get it. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's me cheating right there. But actually, man, if I had one game each category though, I don't know. But I will say for I won't go all over the place with that. But I'll say for myself, definitely would be 
JRPGs would be Dragon Quest, man. I could, man, I love those games. So I could do that. Okay, let me let me try to break this down. I have to think about it. So obviously, anime, I would go with Persona 4 Arena Ultimax. Yeah, definitely. Tekken for 3D, but I would go with Bloodline Rebellion. So six. 2D, ooh, this is tough. There's a lot of good ones. 2D, I would go with KOF 13. Weapon Fighter, I don't play a lot of Weapon Fighters, but the one that I kind of liked was uh, Sam Show 5 Special, if that's considered a Weapon Fighter. Yeah, I think it is. And yeah, I, I don't... Oh, a tag game. Oof. I didn't, I didn't even see that one. Tag? Skullgirls? So I mentioned I mentioned one game, and I didn't see the categories. I'm silly, so I added my own. <laughs> so I'll go by some of those. <laughs> but yo, if there was a, a, a fighting game with Dragon Quest, hell yeah, and it was a Smash, let's get it. Okay, so for 2D, I'd say... Ooh, this is hard, actually. 2D, maybe... Uh, Oh man, what is see? That's my problem, man. I haven't found a good 2D game <laughs> that isn't like an air dasher or anything like that. I haven't found that yet. like a traditional 2D, oh, yeah. Yeah, I've not found that. And I wanted it to be Street Fighter 5, but it was not Street Fighter 5, and it was definitely not Grand Blue. I wanted it to be a KOF game, though, that's for sure. Mm. So I guess I'll put like any KOF, any KOF that I haven't played yet, that maybe it will be that 3D would probably definitely be Tekken. But I don't know, man. I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'd like to try Tech and Tag too. It was kind of busted, but I don't know. <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't know though. 3D because I've only played Tekken Seven. Man. I haven't. I played a little bit of Soul Calibur, but it wasn't that fun. Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't have too much of that. Anime wise, definitely be Persona, man. I'm, I'm right there. Which me and Mac will be on the same island <laughs> playing it. <laughs> right. We uh, Tag it probably would be uh, in a perfect world. It would be Marvel versus Capcom two with godlike balance in a perfect world that would be me right there i wouldn't even say skull girls and i love that game but it needs more characters and i i'll be honest it needs more care i'm tired of fighting game <laughs> uh i'm so tired of that I, I watch i'm gonna be in the island and everybody's just gonna pick ban i'm like oh my god <laughs> um tag games or I actually did i did tag yeah i did tag smash rivals of aether i don't know if you ever played rivals of aether mac but it's a really good game it's basically everything I like in Smash without the Smash component. So Rivals of Aether would probably be right there, man. Mm -hmm. Rivals of Aether is really, really fun. Or um, Project M, which was like a kind of like a, a fan-made version of like Brawl. Okay. Um, and, a, and a Weapon Fighter. See, I don't really got a Weapon Fighter, man. I didn't really play Sam Show games either. I wanted to, but Bad Netco, and, you know, I, I might have to skip, skip on that, that one because I really don't got none. Yeah. Really cool scenario. I like that one. That was good. Now, I believe Organization 13 kind of followed on this one. And he asks, is it finally time for Scruffy's fanfic? Why did I put this in here? Also, <laughs> will I eventually let this go? But he says, for my legit question, what's your favorite fighting games from all of the big developers in the FGC, such as Capcom, Arxis, SNK, Namco, Koei, and One Indie, I guess? The only caveat being to mention a second favorite for Arxis and Pringle men mentioned a second favorite besides Skullgirls, just because those two have been well documented. So we can pick Persona for Arxis and a favorite for each one of these companies, plus an indie. So I guess you can't pick Skullgirls because that's an indie. Damn, I ain't got much indies, man. What, what <laughs> are the indies we got out there that's out there, man? <sighs> Blade Strangers? Yeah, oh my right. God. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I guess. Ooh -wee. I would say Capcom, Street Fighter. Uh, man, I, it's either four or alpha two, but I'll probably I'll go with I'll go with four because I can play Adon, I can play DiCaprio, I can play Sagat, so uh, I'll go with Street Fighter four for Capcom. Arxis hmm. now developed by Arxis or published by Arxis? That's a little different. <laughs> Those are like two different categories, yeah. man. I would say okay, so developed by Arxis, I would go uh, plus R. SNK, KOF 13, obviously. Namco, Tekken 6 BR. Koei Tecmo, I mean, you really don't... You can't, what have they done? Just, just DOA, know. right? So, I don't know. I've, I've only played a little bit of DOA 5, so I guess I have to go with that because I don't have experience with the other ones. And an indie, I'm kind of leaning towards... Okay, I would say I'm... Le oh, so if, if we're in a realistic scenario, like we're just talking about right now, I would probably go with uh, TFH, so Dems Fighting Herds, but... 
Oh yeah. If we're not talking about the scenario and you're t- giving me telling me that like there's good net code and an actual population, I probably would pick Million Arthur. Was that indie though? I mean, kind of, isn't it? Uh, I don't know about that one, man. Let me see. It's from the same people that made Arcana Heart, I think. Mm, Team Arcana. Yeah. But they had the public. The publisher was Square Enix, though. Uh, okay. All right. So they, 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 they got big money for yeah. that, man. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, I, yeah, I would go with them fighting herds. Dang, you got me because I ain't got no indie <laughs> for, from out here talking about, oh, man, I love indies and I got not one indie fighting game out there. <laughs> Well, you, you got Fight of Animals. You got Fantasy Strike. I haven't played those. I can't even think off the top of my head, man. I So for Capcom would definitely be Darkstalkers. Uh, I love that game. That game is sick as hell, man. Right. Arc System, I'm going to hit you with the mix-up, man. Y'all ain't ready for this one, but uh, uh, Sailor Moon S. No. <laughs> <laughs> yo, did you know that Arc System made that? I just Googled it. I, I was like, not. yo, yo, no. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know that either, man. So I'm going to hold a Sailor Moon S because that game is funny. I like it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> SNK, I don't really think I have an SNK. I want to have an SNK game, but I haven't really played any of them too much. Like maybe I'd say KF13 because that's the one I played the most and I really liked it. So yeah, I guess KF13. Namco, what has Namco done nowadays? Soul Calibur, Tekken. Soul Calibur, Tekken. Man, I guess I could just say Tekken 7 because that's really the one I played the most out of all the stuff uh, they've made. Mm -hmm. Um, For Koei, yeah, I don't even know. DOA, right, you said? Yeah, that's really all they're known for, pretty much. Damn, they ain't got nothing else? I, They might. I just don't. I can't recall if if they do or not. Hmm. I don't know, man. What's that? That don't think is that if I said what was that DOA v, volleyball? Does that count? <laughs> sure, why not? <laughs> no, I ain't never play that game though, <laughs> but we'll use that one then. And uh for indie, I'll say, like I mentioned, Rivals of Aether actually is really, really fun. And it and it is considered an indie kind of fighting game. So hey, here you go. I, I didn't think about that one, but I forgot about it. But I, it's not really not that thing, but it's not that much successful indie fighting games that we got going around they really need that uh that money man mm. and the 13th question the last of the baker's dozen comes from pagan on discord and he asks what characters make you rage anytime you see them get picked i think i know yours actually i don't hate him that much okay he's annoying as hell though like i, I don't like fighting him at all but there's actually another one mm. <laughs> You know, uh, Tekken 7's law, I hate when somebody oh. picks his ass. Yo, man, yo, what kind of degenerate, low-life person are you to pick law? All he does is, <laughs> like, yo, man, shut your ass up, man. <laughs> You're so annoying. I, I, I don't rage, man. Like, I really don't rage, but, like, I hate when people pick him. All they do is do random ass crap all the time, man. Like, nobody knows what, not even the law player knows how good law is. That's what pisses me off. So, like, they play him in such a weird and stupid-ass way. Like, I, oh, man, every time I fight him, dude, he's so annoying. Like, I don't like fighting him. They're always doing weird crap, man. Always doing weird stuff. I hate fighting his ass, man. And it's so loud. He doesn't shut up, man. <laughs> <laughs> he always making noises, man. Like, Jesus Christ, shut up, man. All right, he is very loud. Can't stand him, dude. Cannot stand him. Speaking of Tekken, I would say, like, normally I would pick, like, Margaret and Persona 4 Arena. But yeah, I guess just staying on Tekken, I would say Julia. I can't stand playing Julia? against Julia. Yeah, we, is that the one? She's she's a streamer now. A stream? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Nah, nah, nah. She's actually annoying as hell, man. Yeah, I like her though. I like using her, but she's annoying, bro. Like, oh my god, she's so freaking annoying. What is it that th- there's this move she does all the goddamn time? It's this one move that she like the elbow. She pulls out an elbow yeah. or something like that. Uh, so annoying. I, I forgot what that move is called. Party Crusher. Party Crush somewhere else, man. Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> no, she is so so. Julia's high execution, but God, she's annoying to fight. She's just so annoying to fight. Yeah, also, she's so small. Like she doesn't look that small. But she's tiny when you're trying to hit her, and she's really elusive. And God, it's just she she breaks the rules, kind of like Shayu. She's got fairly oh, decent man. mobility, and she hits like a effing truck. Yeah, man, she got a insane, an insane corner carry. Yeah, so 
I don't know. I just don't like Julia in Tekken 7. I never really liked Julia anyway, but Tekken 7 version really made me hate her. <laughs> I'm like, God, she's a <laughs> super annoying. Yeah, and then you and you get body, and she's like, oh, everybody, thanks for watching the stream. I'm like, man, shut your yeah, ass up. I ain't watching your stream, you thought. <laughs> you e-hole. Yeah. <laughs> you just get egg, call her everything under the sun. But yeah, that's all we have for the questions this week. Actually, no, I lied. That's not all we have for the questions this week. We actually got 17 questions this week, but I wanted to keep it at a baker's dozen. So I picked 13. And <laughs> the extra donut. Yeah, we're rolling back four questions. I appreciate all the submissions. Uh, Hollywood really came through because I told everybody that we're, we might have a slow week. So we'll, we're already guaranteed four questions for next week. So that's good. And also, we, we still roll back that one topic that we can always go back to. I don't have a shout out for this week. I, I I looked for somebody to give a shout out, like an indie dev or something, and I couldn't really find it. So I guess shout outs to Hollywood again, right? They came in. Oh, actually, this is not so much a shout out, but this is more of like a blast. Did you see that guy who was on Twitter and he was saying how streamers should pay the license for? Oh, the creator of the, I think he was like the creator of the, the Google Stadia. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Man, I started laughing. I was like, yeah, I mean, listen, I consider myself a boomer, but come on, man. Like, <laughs> he's giving me some competition yeah. there. My dude was like, streamers should already be paying. They're not paying paying for the music for the video games. So for the most part, they should at least pay for the games they stream. I'm like, ah, damn, should bro. Should have a license, Whoa. yeah. Should buy the license yeah. thing to, in order to stream it. Yo, man, everybody saw that. and was like, what a clown. <laughs> uh, yeah, they, they torched that dude on Twitter. It was like, come on, man. What are you doing? But yeah, that's pretty much all I had for today's podcast. Kind of made something out of nothing. It seems like it goes in waves, the FGC. We got we got some news one week, and then we kind of have to event hubs our way into some news the other <laughs> Yo, man, did you hear about Chun-Li's new costume? <laughs> oh. <laughs> but yeah, I don't bring all I know if you had any closing words for our audience for, hey, episode seven, the, the show is growing. We're almost here at double digits. Hey, uh, what was the comment, man? I remember I, I read it somewhere. It's like, it, it made so much sense to me because it's like, man, it really, it, yeah, here it goes. Nobody hates fighting game. This is from a dude named Mono Lolo Loco G, whatever. Nobody hates fighting games more than the people who love them. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. And I started laughing. I was like, man, that's so goddamn true, man. I sound like I hate that crap. When I was like, man, I, man, I hate these fighting games. Man. They suck, man. $60. Then I got to pay a $30 season pass. Then the game's going to come out. Then they're going to nerf my character. Like, come on, this vicious ass cycle. Yeah, I, I, that's actually really true because the worst you can do for any game, not just fighting game, but the, like, the worst you could do, especially in this scene, is stop caring. And like, mm-hmm. once we, yeah, once man. you and I have nothing to shit about on BB tag or or Guilty Gear, that means like that's when it's bad. That's when it's like really bad. Like we just stop caring. So that's doomsday right there. <laughs> yeah, man. But yeah, man, that's all I got for this show. I appreciate you uh, co-hosting with me as you do every week. No doubt, man. But yeah, we'll we'll get out of here. And yeah, shout outs to FGC Hollywood. Shout outs to people who listen. And we'll see you guys next week. Peace. Peace, y'all. Take care.